Um, so, uh, Jin Liu, my partner, she's from China, and indeed, as you mentioned, um, we, we ended up here in New York. In 2008, we started, and we had to find a name, um, and so Solid Objectives, Eidenberg Liu was uh, born, and the idea of Solid Objectives had to do with the idea that we were very interested and committed to say, solidifying objectives, or to engaging with, you know, reality, with the real, with material, with um, actually constructing within, um, we, you know, within the field, within society. Um, but as mentioned, uh, oh, this one, no. That's interesting. Which one do you think it is? <laughs> what? What's happening? What? Oh, it was a delay or something. No, there's the, well, we're going to do very fast. So. There we go. All right, there we are. <laughs> so we started our office and then this happened. Um, this is not the reaction to us opening our office, but it <laughs> very much affected our uh, practice. Um, because if you're committed to building and, you know, the entire economy uh, disappears, then, you know, building um, doesn't really happen immediately. Um, but at the same time, it, it really opened up a new space, and I think it was actually because of this also that there was sort of a space for a new approach, a new thinking. Um, we were very frugal, very um, agile, uh, not so, and, and very flexible in a sense. This openness was very much informed by this as well. The fact that you have to be able to be, you know, in different places, be able to engage with different programs, different publics, different sites, different um, challenges. And so uh, I'm not going to show a lot of buildings, um, but I, I will say that the first, ah, you think it's going to continue like this or not? Okay. Um, so we built a number of buildings. This was, this was our first Kupche uh, gallery. Uh, we built a. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, okay, I'm going to do it with this one. A museum, uh, University of California, Davis. We did a lot of temporary structures to freeze uh, art fair, an installation in Milan for the Salone, a larger uh, institute in, in Hong Kong, uh, and also some um, homes, some very uh, nice homes on dreamy um, locations. Um, but we were not just interested in, in making things. We, the, the idea also that I think very much informs our practice and our thinking is that we want to engage um, with, um, say, society, with, with larger um, issues that are um, at stake in society. And now we're in a phase where we are sort of thinking about how are we going to develop our practice further? Are we going to stay sort of within this realm of uh, artistic um, environments, institutional work, uh, are we going to continue to build um, homes like this? Uh, because it's another part of our practice that I think is really uh, essential, which has much more to do with engaging with the, the public and finding ways to um, engage in conversations and, and more complex uh, issues that are at stake in society. And we feel um, that today, um, you know, in a time where there is like a lot of anger um, everywhere uh, on, for various reasons, uh, be it, you know, access and economy to um, environment, we're wondering um, continuously why, you know, what are we doing as, as architects in relation to this? It's, it's stuff we, you know, we talk about, we think about, and we're wondering how can we as architects actually engage with it? I was in Lisbon the other day, and unfortunately, in some way, architects continue to be very um, sort of stuck in, you know, or we're all stuck in our own sort of echo chamber, completely trying to sort of continue to, you know, indeed have things remain uh, the same. So our, you know, interest in, uh, in say, so-called rationality or, say, uh, representation, sort of an obsessive, you know, moment uh, today with just sort of making sure that your things look good on Instagram. We wonder if that's the way, you know, to have a practice that wants to engage with, uh, with society beyond. And so um, currently, you know, we're thinking about how to, how to deal with the public realm, the public sphere. What are other forms of representation, uh, you know, who are, is being represented. We're very much wondering if this sort of single topic um, um, uh, conversations, you know, where, where, where you either have a, a, a hat or a, or, a, or a vest, 
you know, what are the ways in which we can have more complex dialogues and not get stuck sort of within these, um, within these uh, repeating uh, topics. And so what's the role of the built environment within this? What's the role of stories that can be told, cannot be told anymore? What is the way in which we can address more of these complex um, issues today? And that's really what we, you know, we are actually really um, interested in. And what is, what is interesting now, and so I'm going to show three um, temporary installations that we have done uh, in these 10 years as well um, that maybe talk about certain strategies we have that, in which you could engage you know, with, with um, more complex topics and more um, uh, larger and more diverse, um, um, say, publics. Uh, and then afterwards I will show, because now our practice is a little bit shifting, as you said, from, say, furniture to even um, things on the scale of, uh, of, of landscapes and strategic plans, which engages with larger audiences and how can we use sort of the strategies that we developed in these temporary installations uh, as a way to engage um, uh, these larger uh, audiences. So there's two parts um, of what I will talk about, three temporary installations and then some larger projects we're working on now um, that um, you know, are not finished necessarily yet, but do you know, ask us to, to have these more complex uh, conversations. Um, so PS1 um, was an early project we did, the Young Architects uh, program for MoMA. And it's a simple uh, question, make a fun installation in which people can drink beer and listen to music. Um, but it's also a difficult installation as you know, it's in the backyard of MoMA's uh, courtyard um, and everybody is watching. Um, and this is 2009 uh, and so we took cues from both, say, the legacy of, of, of MoMA as a, a way the sort of treasurer of, of you know, the modern movement and modernity and the idea that we can uh, design, um, um, that we can design our world, right? That we can design structures um, and systems uh, that, that organize uh, us as humans. Uh, these are images of Oscar Schlemmer, a, a choreographer um, and um, uh, yeah, dance, uh, dance choreographer at, at uh, teacher at, at the Bauhaus. Um, the left is called Fanentanz uh, or pole dance, which basically speaks about the relationship between you know the body, uh, us as humans, and uh, uh, the structures uh, around us. And this idea of the effect of us, you know, as a as a body, as a as a human in a larger system, is something that we try to um, introduce into um, our installation at PS1. Um, which also, at that same time, asked questions about exactly the stability of these structures, right? Of our the things we design. So we 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 said we're going to occupy the entire courtyard. We're going to make an interior a space that can be experienced, and we're going to we're going to we're going to build a structure, actually a Cartesian grid, a white gridded uh, structure, um, but not one that offered stability, but actually one that is always on the verge of collapse. Uh, that is completely elastic, and completely weak. Um, and where you or we, um, as occupants, as visitors, as uh, public, are actually responsible for its um, stability. And then we designed a bunch of elements in there that you know, would activate and would start um, um, make this installation actually move um, kinetic and always uh, uh, on the verge of uh, collapse. Um, so the entire courtyard was covered, and here you see uh, the installation. And so. This also um, brought one of the uh, things um, into our practice that I think we still use, which is the idea of play uh, and the idea of games um, and, and open-ended games in that sense. So um, we, you know, these elements that we dropped into this system, there was no, there's no rules, there's no, um, there's no sort of a prescriptive way of how to engage with it. Um, but because of the structure, because of its elasticity, because of the elements within it, it started to produce completely new ways of engagement and um, play and, 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 and sort of operation that we you know, had not necessarily predicted. And so this speaks um, about sort of an idea of, open, of an openness in which you, know, you don't design following um, a, a sort of very clear brief, but you design a structure in which things are allowed to take place and you, um, um, you introduce elements that stimulate sort of um, that kind of occupation. And so, the, you know, we have a whole range of pictures we found on social media that show completely different uses of um, this space. And so play as one uh, 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 element to think about. Uh, another project that is much less known and much less um, um, represented because it actually you had to be there. It only, uh, it, it, it completely disappeared. Um, 
happened also in Queens, in Jackson Heights, um, not uh, far from uh, PS1. Uh, I think it was a year um, after, uh, which we did for the Guggenheim uh, uh, Museum. And the curator of architecture at that time, uh, David Vanderleer, he asked uh, a few, I think, well, it was five boroughs, so um, um, architects and artists to, per borough, uh, find stillness in the city. So where can you find quiet in sort of the crazy cacophony of, um, of New York City? Um, and so we had to find stillness, stillness, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see if we can find it. Um, in, in, uh, in Jackson Heights, um, uh, I think it's 100, 167 languages spoken here. Um, and it is, it is a, I don't know if people have been, it's an incredibly uh, rich and diverse uh, neighborhood. And it's a neighborhood of transition, right? It's a neighborhood through which many people move uh, into this country. And so it is for many people their first home uh, in, in the U.S. or it is, you know, it's a very important uh, place for, you know, to transit into, um, say, American uh, society. And so we called the installation uh, Transhistoria. And what we did is we actually uh, thought about how can you find uh, stillness or how can you create space with words. Um, we, we, we spent time in the neighborhood and, you know, researched the neighborhood and found a number of different um, people, characters, um, there's um, um, musicians, uh, uh, um, uh, priests, uh, writers, poets, um, that all um, we, we felt in some way represented some aspect of that neighborhood and we asked them to write a, a story, write a short um, story about um, this idea of, of finding home uh, within a new, uh, within this new uh, neighborhood. And then we designed a few um, very simple um, uh, blue uh, stools that we spread out throughout the neighborhood over a number of weekends, both on the streets uh, and in parks. Um, and, and then you could, find, uh, you could find these places, you could sit down and then somebody, uh, a volunteer, would come uh, and they would come and start telling you uh, a story. And we're going to listen to a little story now, I think. This was Bonnie's first winter in New York and his second apartment. Before this one, he lived with his brother, an arrangement that worked for some time until his brother resumed his old habit of constantly drinking alcohol, having established which bars nearby would be most accommodating of his limited English and short temper. Shortly after finding his brother had torn his second and last shirt in altercation with a downstairs neighbor, Bonnie decided it was time to find a place of his own. He had worked this out with his brother's old landlord, Mr. Borenstein, who had always liked Bonnie despite, or in contrast to, his brother's constant inebriation. Another apartment was available in Jackson Heights, and Mr. Borenstein assured him it would be perfect for Bonnie and his wife, who would arrive shortly from India. This is where Bonnie found himself that morning, drinking tea and waiting for his wife to come back from Patel Brothers. He figured the tea would keep him warm and the caffeine would fuel his search for a cat which had gone missing somewhere in their small apartment. She had gone out hours earlier while he was asleep to buy groceries. He wasn't sure how long it had been. He figured it was at most two hours. Since waking, he had drank, by his estimate, three and a half cups of tea. He had not yet begun to look for the cat, which had not appeared when he set out his food. He had begun to suspect that he did not like this cat. It was his wife's cat. They had found it together, decided to keep it together, but it was not his cat, it was hers. He suspected this was because he left for work each morning before the sun rose and arrived back shortly after sunset. These were prime hours for the cat, and his wife, who had not yet found employment, got to spend them with the cat. They hadn't named the cat. He claimed they should wait until they thought of something perfect. His wife said cats don't respond to their names the way that dogs do, that they might never really learn their names. But he refused to believe that people would keep animals that didn't know their own names. Of course, his real reason for not naming the cat was that he didn't plan on keeping it for very long. He got up to go to the bathroom. Uh, Bonnie had a habit since coming to America of peeing in the sink. He would lock the door behind him and pull up the toilet seat loudly so everyone outside would hear it bang against the toilet tank and safely assume he was using it. And then he would pee into the sink. After waiting some time, he would wash his hands and come out. 
A few weeks after moving into the apartment, Fani's wife caught him in the act. He had forgotten to lock the door. Disgusting, she said. How can you do that? It's unsanitary. But he claimed he was sitting in water. That Americans were a wasteful lot and that all the pipes were the same. But since being caught, Fani modified his plan by incorporating a pointless flush into his routine <laughs> a few seconds after using the sink in his usual fashion, wasting the water he had wanted to save. As he was washing his hands, Fani thought of something, thought he heard something coming from the toilet. Was it a squeak? Perhaps it was the cat meowing. He checked. There was nothing. Well, he thought, I definitely have heard something. Perhaps it was coming from the shower. Fani pulled the curtains aside. There was nothing. Disappointed and with a headache beginning to form, Fani pulled down the toilet cover and sat with his head in his hands. Now, this cat was not his first. Honey, uh, the name came to him immediately when he saw the tabby, no more than two months old, lying next to a tree by his school. Fani had put it in his satchel and carried it home. Honey is terrible. It's a girl's name, his brother teased. We should name it Johnny after John Wayne, a real man, he insisted. This logic annoyed him. He didn't see gender when it came to animals or babies. They were just cute, helpless flesh to be fawned over and then ignored. Bonnie asked his mother to help name the cat, thinking she would side with him. Hojo was her elegant solution, combining the first two letters Wait. of each name to satisfy everyone. I that thought this was a snippet, but I guess it's going to go on for a little bit. Um, I think we get the point. Um, but so uh, the idea, and so there was a, a number of these. We did that uh, over uh, um, a number of weekends, 13 stories. and. I actually did, never wanted to record it. I did not want to um, have any record of this because it was really about being there and experiencing sort of that space at that moment, experience that, that stillness. And, and in a way, uh, the way in which you can use words and language, which is maybe the, you know, the lightest of all material or maybe the heaviest of all material, but to create sort of a, a, a boundary or an edge between you know, one space um, and the other. And so um, the aspect of this installation, which I think we're, we're thinking about now, is like different narratives, different you know, fictions, different stories, and how you know, that can bring people um, together. And the last uh, and third um, sort of temporary um, installation we did, which deals with issues um, that we are thinking about and are concerned uh, about, we did for the um, Chicago uh, Biennial two years ago. Um, at, um, at the Garfield Park uh, Conservatory in, uh, in Chicago. So this is not in the main uh, space where the Chicago Biennial is happening, but it is actually in, a, in an area west, um, in um, West Garfield Park, which is the, uh, the neighborhood with the highest uh, homicide rate uh, in Chicago, which is obviously already a city with a very high uh, homicide rate. And it is in this beautiful, um, old, historic uh, conservatory, which has been there um, for over 100 to 120 years, uh, and so you come, you know, you, you come into this neighborhood, and then you come uh, through this sort of thin layer of glass in, in this oasis of, of you know incredibly lush uh, nature, um, and obviously the green uh, there, um, uh, say purifying um, uh, the air. And I should say, we worked together with uh, um, um, an artist, performance artist, um, Anna Pravacci, and so together we came up with this idea of uh, contemplating um, uh, the air and contemplating our um, environment. And since the, the Chicago Biennial itself, uh, I think, was, was make new history, it was very much about, again, sort of an internal, say, disciplinary uh, um, and self-referential uh, topic. Uh, we call this installation L'air pour l'air, as a sort of joke uh, towards l'air pour l'air. Um, so air for air's uh, sake. Um, we commissioned a... Um, um, composer to write for, uh, a piece for four wind instruments, so instruments that need the air uh, to perform. So this is a soprano, uh, a trombone, a flute, and a saxophone. And you already guessed that the shape of these outfits um, are, you know, the space, the air, basically, that the musician uh, needs to, to, to perform. So we had to actually adjust the piece, uh, the musical score, a little bit because we couldn't make a cantilever long enough for the sort of you know, one note of the trombone uh, player. Um, and so these, uh, these, these coverings, they were um, made out of air filtering uh, material. So they're a mesh that, uh, that basically filters uh, the air. And so the idea um, 
is that as they perform um, the piece, as they breathe in and breathe out, uh, they, they clean uh, the air. And so we're going to also look at this uh, for a few minutes. I guess I have to. Oh my god, sorry, this guy is still talking. <laughs> what am I going to do? Hold on. <laughs> sorry, can I, wait, how do I, oh my god. <laughs> This went better yesterday, I can tell you, uh, when I rehearsed. I'm just going to delete it. Is that the right thing to do? Stop. Here, how about that? Okay. Is this working? Sorry. So with that in mind, um, we <coughs> went on a road trip this summer um, with our kids uh, through the Rust Belt. Um, and I'm, so the reason why I wanted to show these three projects is because I think that um, the, the elements that we explore there are now informing the way um, we're working on the number of projects um, in this area. Um, and since we 
took our children glamping in Tasmania uh, on spring break, um, we thought maybe now they should see some reality uh, and see sort of uh, other uh, parts of this world uh, in which, you know, this reality uh, is maybe experienced in a different way. Um, and also for us uh, ourselves to actually understand this region uh, of this country uh, better because it has such an effect also on our current uh, political uh, situation. Um, and maybe on the fact that uh, conversations at this moment between different uh, publics seem to be so problematic. And so um, all our stops, in some way we have something to do there, um, either a, a, a project or, you know, we stopped in Toledo because I needed to show um, my kids the Toledo Glass Pavilion where I'd spent five years of my life. Um, but I think this region is a very important region to think about and to understand and to actually understand the, 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 the dynamics, the history and, and the, the, the way um, sort of it evolved. And so um, what better place uh, to start than in the center of power, um, the US or the New York State uh, capital, the uh, Governor Nelson Rockefeller Empire State Plaza and, and Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller will um, be present uh, in many of these stories because he was a very um, a strong and powerful um, figure at that moment as, um, as the governor uh, of New York. Uh, Wallace Harrison built this uh, between 1965 and 1976 uh, for two billion dollars and it housed several um, uh, administrative offices of the state. Um, and obviously this is a very particular way of representing uh, power and um, suggests a very sort of top-down um, um, position in which the role, say, of government, you know, um, uh, um, situates itself uh, within our, um, uh, in our midst. Um, and in order to situate uh, itself there, 7,000 people had to be uh, moved out uh, through eminent uh, domain. And actually, uh, people claim that the reason why Albany you know, went into decline was exactly because of this project, which in some way is very uh, inhumane. Uh, um, at that same time, or actually a little bit earlier, 20 years earlier, and our next stop um, was Buffalo um, and the Niagara uh, Falls. Uh, and I will show a little bit what we're working on there now, but the history of that site, um, Art Park, um, started uh, pretty much here when in 1965, um, <coughs> sorry, no, in 1956, um, this uh, old uh, power station, which is right at the Niagara Falls, uh, collapsed. Um, and as soon as it collapsed, a lot of power was lost. Basically, there's no, ener no, no electricity anymore. And so a lot of uh, local, um, you know, Buffalo, that region was a very strong uh, manufacturing center. Um, but there was a, a, a threat that all these uh, companies would immediately uh, disappear because there was no power and so the factories couldn't run uh, anymore. And so within a very short period of time, Congress passed the Niagara Redevelopment Act in 1957. Um, and obviously, who better than Robert Moses to, you know, uh, put in charge to fix this uh, problem. So within four years, um, they built the new Niagara Power project, which opened in 1961. And here you see Moses and Rockefeller when they, you know, open the new dam and power is back um, in the, the region. And this um, was a little bit further down uh, uh, the Niagara Gorge uh, towards um, towards Canada. Uh, it was in 1961 the largest facility in the Western world and JFK, um, he celebrated it saying that this showed as an example you know, to the world of North American efficiency and determination. Um, the determination also meant that they had to um, displace um, a uh, native tribe um, the Tuscarora uh, nation who actually occupied uh, the land uh, where Robert Moses needed to dig a big um, uh, uh, lake. And so uh, he flooded the fifth uh, of their land. They fought this up to um, the Supreme Court, but ultimately the U.S. Supreme Court decided that, you know, power and um, um, electricity and the economy was more uh, important than uh, the original inhabitants of this land. Um, and as they were digging, uh, this, there needed to be a site to dump everything, and now we're coming to Lewiston, which is, uh, sorry, I'm like really, yeah, right there. So this is Art Park, our 
site. And so this was not a park, um, and it was not necessarily, it was basically um, used as a dumping ground. And so uh, as they were uh, uh, building this, uh, this, this uh, hydro power installation, you know, the soil uh, uh, needed to be left uh, somewhere. And so this big pile of sand uh, appeared in this town uh, of Lewiston. Um, there was then a local um, um, entrepreneur who wanted to organize uh, outside uh, drama. And uh, he said, well, this could be a beautiful site. There was a story, a script he had written about uh, a First Nation narrative, and he wanted to have an outside performance space to perform this. And so he contacted the local uh, state um, senator, Earl Bridges, uh, to say, can we use the land? Because the land was you know, state-owned. Uh, and. Earl said, that's a great idea, um, but why don't we build a full-fledged theater here that can have you know, fantastic uh, productions uh, for dance, for music, um, for theater, and what have you, like a real uh, large stage. Um, unfortunately, there was not a lot of money, and so they decided to go ahead and building the, the project, but without a lobby, without storage spaces, without closets, dressing rooms, offices, rehearsal rooms, a box office, uh, and most importantly, um, they didn't have uh, good sight lines. It was a really bad plan that was willed, in a way, from you know top down into the uh, in, onto this uh, site. And so people already felt that this is not going well, and everybody left. And it was uh, ultimately <coughs> left in a newly uh, appointed uh, commissioner for parks and recreation who had to sort of manage this this project. And so they basically had three options at that moment: it's either, you know, stop it. Um, before it was too late and just take it apart again, which would be a disaster, um, um, at least um, 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 as a PR, from a PR point of view. The other would be to just finish it and see what happens. And the other would be to actually make a large sort of art park uh, around it uh, and sort of have all the arts being addressed and in some way maybe um, sort of reduce the, the importance of this um, somewhat um, dysfunctional theater uh, amongst its middle. And so they started this um, um, artist residency program. And yeah, this is where Rockefeller comes in again. He says, well, let's, let's go you know, all out. Let's make this uh, a wonderful uh, place. And so funding was there to start programming and to start uh, bringing artists in. Um, Robert Smithson had uh, died uh, um, the year before in 1974 when Art Park uh, opened. And so they started a, um, a uh, residency in his uh, name for um, for basically artists to operate and to work on this, uh, um, in some way, pile of, uh, of dirt um, or you know new uh, land, and um, here and maybe this ties even into our own um, practice. The idea was process over product. So artists were asked to be there to interact with the audience and to produce work very much in response uh, to the land, and it was really. Um, a lot of, um, say, land art um, and um, um, environmental art and the whole environmental art movement actually started very much uh, around um, this uh, art park. Not everybody could go to the desert uh, and dig gigantic cities or craters. Uh, and so for many artists, actually, uh, art park was the first site in which they could experiment um, with um, mm -hmm with the land. And so there were you know, some macho uh, actions like uh, Gordon Mata Clark uh, here on the right in some way channeling this uh, collapse 20 years earlier of the, of the power uh, plant with a work called uh, Bingo and also Chris Burden uh, with his beam drop uh, that he did uh, there. But there was also more sensitive approaches and a lot of um, female artists working on uh, different projects in a more um, um, reflective way with the with the land. Uh, Nancy Holt, uh, um, Robert Smithson's uh, uh, widow, also uh, uh, produced uh, uh, work there, and also uh, Alan Sonfist with the Pool of Virgin Earth, in which he basically made um, this uh, crater, this circle, uh, and uh, had seeds sort of blow in and gradually sort of harvest seeds that were just you know blowing through the air uh, and um, having uh, th that uh, um, sort of grow. Uh, and he claims uh, that that's the way in which ultimately the entire park uh, became green. And so there was for 10 years an incredible, um, here you see the theater, um, and, but you also see the landscape around it that uh, the artists uh, um, uh, created uh, over those uh, 10 years. And it was for many people, many people in the town and many people in the region, many people in Buffalo that you speak, it was a really important place. It was a really fantastic um, place where they really learned um, um, 
well, they engaged with many different forms of art. And so it was a very strong, say, civic asset for this uh, uh, region and something that brought the community um, together. And then in 1984, uh, politics changed and funding dried up and actually the park was pretty much left um, abandoned, um, except for that through the summer, uh, they have 12 um, classic rock uh, concerts. Um, and we went to one uh, when it opened uh, this season, which is Sammy Hager, um, who at 71 uh, at some point got so enthusiastic, he said, you know, you guys don't go die on me now because I really like what I'm doing uh, and I want to come back here the next uh, 10 years. But it's probably another 10 years that both uh, Sammy Hager and the audience are able to sort of entertain each other in that s space. Um, and so the new director said, you know, our, our, our acts are dying and our audience is dying. Um, what should we do? Um, and this is where we uh, got in. And I don't know if you're happy that... <laughs> not there was also uh, uh, thinking about working on this project. But I, it's a very... It's a very uh, so we... Uh, <laughs> It was a very, so, so we went in with, um, with um, West 8 uh, landscape uh, architects uh, who um, did Governor's Island, of course, here, uh, and uh, also Charcoal Blue, a theater um, consultant from, from the UK but, uh, that work everywhere. Um, but very quickly we realized, and so it's, it's also quite interesting because you don't win with a, it's not about a master plan, right? It is an approach and you have to work with people. There's not like, it's, so the idea of the master plan is completely countered the, the actual uh, necessity of this site. It's much more about what are the ways in which you can engage with all these different audiences to create something that they themselves feel is their park uh, again. Um, and there's a lot of nostalgia, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, listening to stories of how great, you know, it used to be. And in some way, at some point, we also felt that actually the, 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 the brief was make Art Park great again. Um, and, and this nostalgia in some way needs to be channeled and, and sort of re, you know, reorganized into something that is much more uh, forward looking and, 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 and uh, maybe also more uh, inclusive. And so we also, um, you know, brought a lot of different people in, but certainly also the, the uh, First Nation. Um, um, uh, there's two, basically, uh, uh, nations that, that, you know, used to uh, live here. Uh, and we speak with them about what the land means for them and what the history means for them and how we should treat uh, um, the park and, and, and this site from, from their uh, point of view. Uh, and also bringing in new possible uh, partners, new possible artists, but also maybe people that want to start uh, other um, 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 uh, activities and, and, and businesses, actually, uh, within that. And so, uh, going through the entire history also of all these layers of soil that have been dumped you know on this land and 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 realizing that this is not nature it's not you know it's not something that has uh, that is it's not beautiful it's not um, it's it's this endless sort of uh, layering and constructing of, of human you know ideas over and over the sort of sedimented on top of each other and while working we, we also discovered that you can turn off the Niagara Falls which we thought was really exciting um, they did that in 1969 uh, um, to clean out trash but actually also to see if they can make it more beautiful um, and so this made us also think about sort of what is our relationship you know how, how are we as, as humans tinkering you know with our with our planet and with um, with this site. So there's a lot of really complex and very interesting uh, conversations that are currently sort of informing our thinking. And so one approach um, that we uh, have and are further developing, and this is sort of the, the current, um, say, framework with which we are uh, working, is to not, you know, try to beautify or not to erase sort of its history, but in some way make sort of all these layers and make this idea of the artificiality of this uh, ground really tangible for uh, an audience and not just you know for people who really um, spend a lot of time here but also for the Sammy Hagar uh, fan um, uh, and so one one thing for instance is that we that we emphasize the truck road that was used basically to dump uh, the soil uh, and, and sort of this terraced um, setting we are trying to uh, to actually make it more clear and more legible that people realize that this is really constructed land in which you can experience from the top uh, all the way to the bottom of the gorge, sort of these different uh, layers. 
and in some way showing sort of these the the, the piles the, um, the 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 different um, uh, moments in time in which you know soil was was left here on this site. Um, we're working with uh, different. Um, so the, the the other thing that we're developing is sort of an uh, an attitude with regards to how you know do we now deal with um, the environment not necessarily in the, in, the, in the sort of poetic way that land uh, uh, artists work, but much more in a sort of environmental conscious way in which also sort of maybe even um, say eco ecological data is part of the uh, experience um, itself. Um, th these images don't necessarily relate to what I'm saying, but they give you a good um, uh, Backdrop, and then we do a relatively light uh, touch uh, on uh, you know the site itself. So we don't, we're not going to make s sort of super heavy new uh, constructions, but we actually create sort of places throughout the park that can be uh, occupied in different uh, uh, ways to to emphasize um, all the different qualities within the the site uh, itself. And the largest uh, sort of thing that we're working on currently, which is also probably the most uh, complex and maybe um, interesting, is that we're really um, sort of integrating this amphitheater, which is going to be um, reoriented uh, and, and improved in its in the way the, the, the visitor can experience it um, in the landscape itself, so that also when there's nobody there, it's actually a beautiful and sort of wondrous uh, landscape. Um, what it also involves is an incredible amount of conversations with uh, different people, stakeholders, and funders to find uh, new ways in which actually there can be sort of a financial um, you know impulse uh, into this area and that, and that's so one one thing that we realize now the scale of these projects are actually much more about co organizing conversations and sort of designing narratives rather than uh, shapes or spaces or uh, um, objects um, to be continued uh, we uh, drove on and also we were trying to tell our kids that we were not actually uh, looking at architecture but you know we're uh, having fun and we're on a holiday so we um we i, I will skip <laughs> though the holiday uh, pictures but so we um we um we we arrived in cleveland and in cleveland um you see lake erie uh, behind uh, we're working now on a public library the martin luther king uh, branch for the um uh, cleveland public library and so cleveland <coughs> at some point about uh, you know over 100 years ago was was the sixth largest city um in uh, in the us and a very powerful city mostly because of steel and um it, it has sort of its old downtown at the lake uh, here at the site where we are uh, building it was sort of uh, sort of a second downtown um university circle and it's the end of uh, euclid avenue and euclid avenue um was uh, um uh, in that day called Millionaire's Row. And here Rockefeller comes back, but it's Rockefeller's grandfather, who was actually the founder of uh, US uh, oil, or Standard Oil, uh, and he built, he was one of the most prominent inhabitants of uh, Millionaire's Row here uh, in Cleveland. Over time, this area, um, um, you know, uh, came in, in disrepair and got overtaken by expansion, but actually our site is right sort of in what is left uh, from this very um, uh, um, um, sort of rich historic uh, area that now basically is a, is a hot, hodgepodge of different um, uh, histories. Um, and is being re... Um, re um, well, they're, they're trying to um, um, uh, infuse it with new uh, life and new uh, activity. And so the project that we're doing is part uh, of that. Also, uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art that uh, Farshid uh, designed is also around the corner there. And there's the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art, which apparently is the best endowed museum in the country because of this you know, old wealth that used to be uh, in Cleveland. Um, in the circle, you see the current um, branch, uh, the current Martin Luther King branch, uh, um, which was built and named after him right after his assassination. Um, and on the left, you see um, how it was envisioned as sort of an open public and por porous space with a certain civic um, uh, presence. And on the right, you see how it's currently, where it is actually quite uh, well used, but it doesn't have sort of this, uh, I mean, there's just not a lot of people on the street that sort of occupy these, um, these, uh, this enfilade, or not enfilade, the, the, the uh, sorry, walk, uh, uh, the portico uh, in between. Um, and so now a, a developer um, has given, is given the opportunity to move the library 
um, around the corner, so the library is currently here, to move it over here, um, but built uh, uh, so that he can build a building there, and also he can build a building on top of the library, the new library that we're doing. And so it's a very complicated or, um, uh, process again, where there is a public uh, component, the, the Cleveland Library, and there's a private component, which is this developer, that together have to figure out a way to build one building you know, at the same time with two different and contradictory programs. Uh, we spend a lot of time, an incredible amount of time, with the different um, con groups in the area that you know use or will use this uh, neighborhood or uh, yeah, branch library, um, because there is you know many dif different demographics for whom the library all has a very different uh, role or function within their. Uh, lives, and through these workshops um, and sessions, you know, we developed a number of uh, observations, which maybe uh, are things that, if we all think about it collectively, we can also figure that out. But it is very important that you do that together with with the public and with the people that will ultimately use uh, this space. So, but obviously, the the library is very much changing from a place where you go to find a book or to find information to actually a place where you go to find each other, if you want, or to find uh, access to. Um, um, I would say um, civic uh, society. There's very few places, and it was really uh, interesting to learn. We visited all these uh, branch libraries for, for, you know, how for many people this is sort of a last uh, lifeline, if you want, towards jobs, towards uh, information, towards you know being able to participate in our um, society. And so this idea of the last civic place, we wanted to <coughs> sort of clearly separate it from the private uh, development uh, upstairs. So the first thing that was really important is to sort of make a, uh, um, a roof in a way or a canopy that really divides it from the, the building uh, above. Um, and then show um, this uh, public uh, space as a very open, um, uh, open uh, institute. Uh, and most importantly, I think, on the inside, we said we make one big table. The entire um, library is actually organized around the table, and everybody is welcome uh, at this table. And the table uh, houses, you know, places to work, but it also it houses books. It also acts as a stage. It acts uh, as a as a place to hang out. And so the entire library is being developed around this sort of large single table that obviously, you know, works um, very symbolically um, as well. Currently, we are, you know. Uh, negotiating uh, with the developer how much space he needs for his private lobby on the ground floor to bring people into the apartment above uh, and how much space um, uh, the library itself uh, has. Um, again, ongoing, so um, now we are in design uh, development uh, here. Next stop. Um, Columbus, Indiana, yeah, some, pe some people knew. Very good. <laughs> um, who's been there? Everybody's been there. Good. Very good. All right. Everybody should go also. It's very nice. Um, so Columbus, Indiana is a very particular small um, town in uh, the middle of Indiana. Um, and so it's, it's, you could say it's just a town, but it's actually a really special town. And it's a special town uh, because of two people. Um, which is um, Irwin, or Joseph Irwin Miller and his wife, uh, Celia Simmons Miller. Um, and they were, um, in many ways, uh, exemplary um, figures for how one, you know, if one has uh, power and wealth, could actually engage with, you know, our, uh, uh, our environment. Um, born in uh, the beginning of the century, 1909, and he died in 2004, uh, Mr. Miller. Um, he, you know, was born into the, the family already had a bank and had uh, uh, industry. Uh, his uncle or his great uncle had started this company called uh, Cummins Engines. Uh, Cummins was their uh, African American um, uh, mechanic who had, was fixing their car and in the process invented uh, the diesel engine. Um, and then the Millers said, well, why don't we um, start a, a company, um, a diesel engine company, and they, they named it after the mechanic, so it's called Cummins Engines after uh, him, and it's now the largest um, diesel engine um, manufacturer in the world, and its seat is in, um, in uh, Columbus, uh, Indiana. Um, so for uh, Mr. Miller, it was not just important to you know, have a great business, but also to create a fantastic place for the entire uh, um, 
people, well, basically the whole town, everybody who was involved in the factory, but also beyond. Um, and so um, he was, he built basically a lot of, and I will show some of the, uh, the projects, but basically he said every public uh, building in this town, um, he would support um, the architectural fees. He would make sure, he said, we get, we're going to get the best architects here, and I'm going to pay, you know, for their designs. Um, and, and they built um, every public structure there with one of the, you know, with, with, a, with the leading architect of its time. He was also a very strong civil rights um, activist, actually, and he worked together with, uh, with um, Martin Luther King uh, to organize the march uh, on Washington. And there was, at some point, people wanted him to become president, but he always uh, stayed away from that, and he actually always stayed um, in uh, Columbus, uh, Indiana. And so, uh, obviously, he was also uh, um, supporting the church. He had uh, Eliel, two Sarinans built uh, churches there. So on the left, uh, Father um, Eliel, and on the right, uh, Iro Sarinan, uh, two churches. Uh, IMP um, did the, the library. Um, and also, uh, he had Kevin Roche uh, very much involved doing a post office, doing a number of buildings, but also the plant itself. So the, the, basically, the factory itself. On the right, you see uh, Kevin Roche uh, designed. Uh, factory um, building. And so this idea that you can actually construct uh, uh, with good architecture a really um, civic uh, society, I think is very much in, in, you know, within his, um, um, uh, well, that's, that's I think the strongest uh, part of, of his belief and, uh, and his legacy. He also built his own house. Um, this is 1953. Uh, Sarinen uh, designed the house. It's sort of a classical nine grid, if you want, uh, organization. Um, very uh, modern uh, at the time with skylights um, uh, uh, at, uh, on those uh, sort of gray lines coming in. Uh, Alexander Girard doing the uh, interiors, um, and you could say it's really a sort of a, you know most exemplary home of, uh, of mid-century uh, moder modernity. Actually, Kevin Roche was the project uh, architect there, and Dan Kiley did the landscape. And so um, the senior Miller died in 2008, um, and at that moment. Um, it was sort of unclear what, what would happen with this legacy, what would happen with their legacy, and, and what would happen to Columbus and, this, um, and its relationship to, to modern uh, architecture. A number of years ago, they started Columbus, um, uh, Exhibit Columbus, uh, which basically asks um, architects to do an installation or do something uh, that responds to or thinks about or helps us think about the role of, you know, design within uh, the public uh, sphere um, and what you know we as architects can do um, in in those dialogues and so we were asked this year to do an installation um, and that's the one I will present now um, and so we like to make maybe or you know sort of bring history or bring these narratives into um, the installations uh, themselves and respond very much to um, to the, to the site and to the brief. Uh, and so we took, uh, in a way, the sort of patterns of, uh, of Girard, and uh, here you see Zinia herself actually embroidering uh, uh, them, uh, and also the idea of the landscape uh, by Dan uh, Kiley um, into, the, into the installation. And when we visited the house, we learned that they're going to replant uh, the, the hedge. This is the hedge around the uh, Miller house uh, designed by Kiley, which is sort of this sort of uh, staggering um, layers, but they are like a, a, they divide basically the public um, and the private uh, realm. And we just, we, we, we are now um, sort of made a promise to ourselves that whenever we do a temporary installation, we think about what happens afterwards uh, so that we don't create more waste that just goes into the dumpster. Uh, and so when we heard that they're going to plant these uh, uh, plants, the, the hedges, um, uh, next year, we said, why don't we have sort of a pre-life of these hedges? Why don't we use actually the hedges themselves as the installation? Uh, and so we approached the Miller House and their gardener, and we said, what you know, what are the uh, the plants you're going to uh, put in the hedge? I said, can we can we uh, make um, can we um, um, make an installation with them, and then we donate them to the to the house. And so the installation we proposed and built for uh, Columbus um, Exhibit Columbus this year is called Into the Hedge, um, and it speaks about sort of this idea that you can make the hedge a place where you can explore, because a hedge normally divides, right? It separates, um, but wouldn't it be nice if we can go in and experience the hedge as a as a social place uh, in itself? And so we're on the corner of next to the courthouse in one of the most public. As, um, areas of, of Columbus, we made this large um, organization array in a circle of the of the hedges that then are and they're floating, right? They're hanging. We don't plant them in. They're actually just sitting in sort of these um, um, 
um, big baskets or uh, or uh, yeah uh, bags, um, uh, and we we then uh, activated with um, uh, uh, places for sitting and occupation and uh, hanging uh, out, and so this is it from above, and here are some more from above. Okay, two more. Um, in, so, Indianapolis, from Columbus we went to Indianapolis. Indianapolis, we are involved uh, in another competition. Um, this time we collaborate with SCAPE um, architects. Um, for a very complicated site, here you see downtown um, Indianapolis, and on the left you see a large structure, um, the Crane Bay. Uh, which is an 800 feet old uh, industrial structure uh, that is the only remnant of a very large uh, site, a 103 uh, acre site, and that has been a place in which initially uh, carriages were uh, produced, but mostly um, it was a, a stamping plant, which a metal stamping plant where basically car companies uh, produce uh, uh, the steel components that make uh, the car. So Chevy um, has been there since the 1930s. Um, and uh, well, you see how incredibly large it was. It was the main uh, sort of uh, um, um, a job, uh, a place for jobs for, for uh, uh, 6,000 people in the, in the area, mostly actually in this area uh, next door called uh, the Valley, a neighborhood where most of the workers uh, lived and uh, worked. Um, in 2009, um, the GM um, uh, was uh, bankrupt or was going through bankruptcy and the plant was closed and all the jobs uh, disappeared. Um, the building, the structure itself was built, is designed by Albert Kahn and people maybe know him as sort of the, the, the architect of Detroit, so to say the one who really um, developed and um, improved uh, industrial buildings, built many, many, many industrial buildings all around the world, um, and he transformed this um, from, say, wooden structures into steel structures with daylight, really improving the, the, the quality of the life of the um, workers in the factory. But here you see it uh, as it is now with the Crane Bay uh, left as its only remnant. And then there was a, there was a, a developer who bought the land um, and he uh, proposed here on the left uh, a business park. Um, so uh, with just some quite uh, generic uh, office towers. And then Rene and Jane, um, longtime residents of the valley next door, third generation um, uh, workers in the factory said this is not uh, right and they got involved and uh, they started to talk to the city and they said we need to do something that is much more you know respectful also much more thoughtful and much more integrated uh, with uh, the neighborhood itself and that is when what, what sort of triggered uh, the competition so uh, these people they really uh, said we need to we need to really think about how can this not just be sort of sort of isolated park but actually really um, be much more inclusive and be much more um, uh, offer much more benefits for the people you know that actually were uh, very much part you know of the history of this site um, there is a, a, another component which has to do with uh, the remediation of the of the pollution um, because also there was a, a lot of polluted water but I don't exactly know the technical specificities to that you have to ask Kate Orff, um, but we are we are working on the sort of uh, the architectural components and the activation of this um, of this site with public uh, little public impulses and also how to deal um, with that um, with that crane bay uh, itself. There's also a bridge um, um, being proposed to connect it to downtown where there is more activity happening. But we are working 
with this crane bay, um, which doesn't, is not a monument, uh, it's very long, and we need to think about how to bring new life into uh, this structure. Uh, also over time, it's not that you can suddenly just say this is going to be a museum or, or whatever. You need to find ways in which there is also enough funding uh, and so develop strategies for how this um, uh, building can um, gradually uh, uh, be, have a new um, life. And so we're working, you know, uh, bringing in different uh, programs, different uh, users, um, food-related businesses, uh, performance-related businesses, and art uh, and an art um, space. Uh, and in a sort of small twist, we, we take the historic structure and in a way bend it or pry it open, if you want, towards the facing towards the downtown and where the bridge uh, arrives, creating sort of a new, um, say, welcome uh, into this into this uh, neighborhood. Again, this is still uh, ongoing, um, and I wanted to. I'm not going to um, tell more of our trip, but you know, if you look at all of this, um, obviously this has a lot to do with the automotive um, industry, and a lot of jobs that used to be there they all disappeared. And this brings us to the last project that we're working on uh, and currently building, which is on the other side of the wall um, in uh, Mexico in uh, Guadalajara. Or Guadalajara, no? Yeah, Guajato, sorry. Uh, over here, like, well, we're in the city of Leon, but this area is called uh, um, uh, Guadalajara. Um, where all the jobs went. Uh, all these jobs uh, uh, in the automotive industry, many of them went to this area uh, in, uh, in and around uh, Leon. And that's one of the fastest growing um, um, uh, uh, areas for migrant uh, workers. Um, and so there is something in uh, Mexico called Infonavit, which is like a Freddie Mac, um, Fannie Mae sort of um, uh, uh, organization that offers uh, mortgages to the lowest income uh, uh, groups. Um, but this has produced a very bizarre sort of urbanism because they don't necessarily build housing, but they say, you know, under the con on these and these conditions, you know, we can offer a loan uh, and you can uh, own your house. And this has produced endless sort of landscapes of this kind of housing very far away outside of the city centers because there the land is cheap enough for developers uh, to build um, within um, the sort of tight constraints of these uh, of these mortgages, and so these areas uh, very quickly turn into this kind of spaces because basically there's not enough money to bring you know the trash and the uh, the, the clean up the pick, trash pickup there or actually have schools there or you know have even um, uh, uh, transportation there and they're often left sort of semi uh, uh, as ghost towns at the periphery of the city, and we we got involved um, through. Um, somebody who had seen some of our work uh, here, um, but mostly also was thinking maybe we can help in having uh, different stakeholders, because a lot of different people are involved in this, in this process and project, um, in how to uh, uh, have them figure out uh, a new sort of typology that could happen in the, um, the much more city center. So can we help uh, the different stakeholders imagine a vertical typology, something that actually happens uh, much more in the city centers where the land is more expensive, of course, um, but so in a way that these people actually have access to their jobs, uh, have access to transportation and to um, yeah, the, the, the benefits that, that the city uh, offers. And so we designed a game um, that could be played by the, the different stakeholders here in uh, Leon. So it's, this, it's city planning, but it's also the developers, it's the banks, it's the, con the construction companies, it's the uh, housing um, 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 say um, resident uh, organization and we asked them to just we asked for two different sites and we asked we, we gave them glue and um, uh, pieces of uh, foam and uh, um, scissors and literally something that we maybe do every day um, but these people together had to sort of answer to a brief and try to through um, making these different uh, um, proposals actually un you know learn and understand what were the what was at stake for them from their point of view, and in that way, everybody was able to actually articulate and think about you know what for them was important, but also understand what is important from somebody else's point uh, of view, and it was a, a, a success. And then they said, "Well, that was nice. Why don't you guys do one?" Um, and so we are working now on um, 55 uh, units. Um, in one of these sites that we have as a test case uh, site, um, where the total budget um, for the entire construction is $2 million. For, so that's 55 units. The house that I showed uh, in the beginning um, was two and a half times as expensive. So you could build uh, more than 100 units uh, in exchange for one of those um, homes. Um, 
with housing, and this is maybe also coming back to the beginning, you know, we, we don't just want to be involved in, say, um, uh, museums and sort of high-end uh, areas. We, we very deliberately have been trying to also get, you know, into things that actually, um, you know, there's more of maybe in society and have a bigger impact on, on uh, everyday life. And so one of the things with housing, which we are excited about that we're working on now, is that we think that the single or the double-loaded corridor is one of the most dreadful spaces one can imagine, right? The journey between the street and your front door through a, a double-loaded corridor is quite... Um, unfortunate in, in, in our uh, experiences. So we're always trying to figure out, can we break it or can we get rid of that? And, um, here you see the development of the scheme, uh, which is luckily possible because of the very mild uh, climate in uh, Leon, we could actually have the circulation on the exterior, make some sort of courtyard uh, organization. Uh, and then here on the right, we see how we sort of weave it between uh, the units. We didn't want to make a massive uh, block. We wanted to in some way break it down so that people could also uh, recognize you know, where in the building they were. It, it's quite, um, it, so the, the, there was quite a fear that people don't want to live in vertical housing. It's very much the, the, the tendency of people building their own uh, sort of housing at the periphery. Uh, of the city, and so it's like, how do we make sure there's enough that, that, that people, you know, are willing and are interested in living in such a uh, um, uh, uh, larger communal uh, building? Uh, two courtyards and uh, some porosity that I will speak about later, where there's common spaces where the where the community can get together. An entrance uh, over here marked at its uh, highest point. Um, the units themselves, all two bedroom and three bedroom. Uh, of, of course, quite uh, straightforward. Um, and since we have this uh, um, 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 corridor along the units, um, we didn't want to have people stare sort of straight into your room, and so we rotate the windows so that light uh, comes in, uh, but not necessarily everybody is looking uh, inward. Um, here you see the, the plan uh, of the second floor. Uh, so you enter underneath here on the ground floor. Here's the staircase. There's this open walkway around and there's another staircase that goes all the way up in the building and here's one of these communal spaces, uh, shared uh, spaces, um, more in the building. So we worked together with the local uh, housing uh, authority and um, we did uh, basically all the design, they did the construction uh, documents, we were working with them and Skyping with them on a sort of a daily basis and this is the end um, design and we thought we make uh, precast uh, concrete panels, the facade only needs to be eight um, centimeters, so uh, a thick single layer because of the, the climate actually uh, there. Um, and so they said, that's great, we're going to do it. And we went to a precast company and they said, we can do it. And we asked for a mock-up and they said, you guys should come and see. And they made the mock-up and this is the mock-up here on the right. And we said, that's strange, it's precast. Why would you pour it standing straight up? Uh, that doesn't make sense. And they said, yeah, we tried something else. It really didn't work um, and but actually when, uh, when when you know after a long conversation they said you know you know what it is there's actually only one company that can do it and they, they're in Guadalajara and they have to you know cast it there put it on the truck drive you know for a number of, for four or five hours to Leon and then we need a crane we need to install it with a crane um, and so the cost of installing one panel um, uh, is the same as employing 30 workers for 30 days, right? And so then we said, well, that doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense if all the budget goes to this one company that is not even in the in the area. And can we not uh, figure out a way to employ and in, uh, and, and bring in um, the 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 you know the community itself? And so we asked, what is the what's the heaviest uh, weight, the most weight that the single um, worker laborer can carry, which is 17 uh, kilos? And so we worked with a with a a block company to develop a custom uh, block um, that allows for this complex sort of um, 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 meandering, uh, to, to negotiate this meandering uh, uh, geometry, which is exactly 17 kilos. So the, the wall actually is divided in, in, in five, and so they can stack and, and build this wall, and then we develop this custom sort of, um, and actually Ted Bob was very uh, uh, important in thinking about this, so it's good to, uh, that he is here at the faculty. Um, but to, um, to think of a, 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 a shape that actually allows you know, many different settings. So in order to negotiate the curve, you always have to sort of adjust the, the angle. 
Um, and that's where we came up with this not perfect uh, uh, pentagram or pentaform uh, shape, just a little bit off that allows sort of to negotiate all these different settings. So here's the mock-up for the second time, much better and much more exciting. So this is the, the wall um, on the left. And then also we were able to make um, windows uh, out of steel welded together in local shops uh, in the neighborhood of where we're building with a very simple, elegant detail of how to hold it uh, open. Uh, two types of windows that are now being uh, made. So this is the updated um, render and representation. Uh, some nice images for the mayor that he can show what he's doing, but he doesn't have to wait uh, that long because we're under construction now and should be finished um, next year. Um, so that's it for now. Thank you.